ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world, and especially to my fellow veterans, I am very happy to finally have on the show my favorite United States Senator, one of my favorite guys in D.C. Now, candidly, there aren't a lot of people I like in D.C. anyway, but after a very long wait, I am very happy and thrilled and honored to finally have, have joining us on, on Independent Americans, the great and powerful Senator John Tester. Welcome to Independent American Senator. Paul, let me, let me tell you something. Uh, great introduction. I appreciate it. I don't think I'm worthy of all that, but, but I will tell you this. Uh, I used to see you on a weekly basis, almost a daily basis up here as you were advocating to do right by our nation's fighting men and women. And I just want to say it's great to see you again, man. Great to see you. You too. I, I miss you. I miss you. There were a lot of shitty things about working in Washington, but one of the better parts was working with you. And uh, I, I say that without reservation. You are my favorite senator, in part because you're a real human being. Uh, you're a great guy to hang around with. You're honest. You have integrity. I think you represent a lot of the best of what is possible in politics. I want to talk about, yep, you got, you know, you're missing a couple fingers from a farming accident. This is a good reason to watch on video. If you haven't before, the senator just held up his, his hand. It was meant to stop, but keep going. Oh, That's I'm sorry. Was, I mean, you, know, you got to stop, but, you know, keep going. I mean, I, I feel, I've got mixed emotions here. You're, you're giving me a head so big, I'm not going to get out the door, Okay. But well, I, for, for, for the listeners, because they probably don't know, I'm a, I'm a farmer from Montana. Uh, my folks ran a butcher shop. We took the butcher shop over. It was on the farm. Uh, when my folks were running it, I was nine years old. I made a mistake sticking my hand on a meat grinder. Um, it, uh, long story, I think it hypnotized me. I was done grinding meat and all that. But the question you guys are asking yourselves right now is why would a nine-year-old be grinding meat and uh, I will tell you that I did a lot of things at nine years old. I ran a baler. I ran a farm tractor. Uh, we worked. And, uh, and I will tell you that it was a life-changing event. I probably wouldn't be a U.S. senator if this wouldn't happen. But I do not recommend that if any of you go out there and get in a fight with power equipment. Because power equipment always wins. There's no antiseptic way of taking off limbs. Uh, and it's very, very rough. And... And quite frankly, I learned a lot from that experience. I consider it a failure in life, and you learn a lot from your failures. Mm. Uh, but but in the end, um, it's something that my folks never looked at as a disability. They looked at it as something I need to live with and adapt to, and I did it, and I've never considered it a disability. In fact, Paul, you know this. When I first got here, they, they, there were stories written time and time again about this guy's mangled left hand, and I have never, ever, ever I've never seen my hand as a mangled left hand. I've seen it as a hand that doesn't have as many fingers on it as my other hand does. And oh, so well, it's just the way it is. Man. I love it. This is part This is part of why we love it. You, you kind of got a, a, for Giants fans, football fans, like a JPP hand, right? Like Jason Pierre-Paul lost, I think, three fingers in a, in a 4th of July fireworks accident. So if you were on the football field, you'd probably have some really cool kind of thing on it. But um, it has empowered you. And, you know, that whole story, I think, underscores why you have made such a connection with me and so many other people. You're a real human being, which is which is, you're a grounded human being. You're thankfully the chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee now. But you're also a farmer. I wore this shirt since you showed me yours. Uh, I'm actually wearing a shirt in, in your <laughs> honor. It is it is your two of your favorite things. It's a Ukrainian uh, yeah. farm tractor yeah. pulling a Russian tank. Yeah. And it's kind of your two favorite things, farmers and veterans together in one shot. So I wore that in your honor. I want to uh, meet that farmer. I'll tell you that. I want to meet that farmer. That guy's that that's called balls right there. <laughs> well, there, there's there's a lot I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you a little bit about Ukraine. I want to talk about the PACT Act and all that's going on with veterans. I want to talk about the state of America and the state of politics. Um, I, I would love to 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 get into some of our funner questions. Um, but as a starting point, you know, you and I met, I think when we, we both kind of hit Washington at the same time. Right. 2006 was your first year in the Senate uh, and you still owe me a basketball game. You, you challenged me in your staff to my staff to a basketball game. And I lost about 35 pounds. And if my Achilles will ever get back to normal, I think I could almost compete with you. But it's going to be tough. You're a lot younger than I am, man. You're a lot well, I got I got That's leaner. I got I got a little leaner right now. I've got covid. So that might slow me down. But even then with covid, I saw you and Senator Booker doing this body check video on Capitol Hill. 
I, I think you're both a little step slow. You're two of the biggest dudes on, on Capitol Hill, so you're like a one-two punch of, of – I think he was a tight end and maybe you'd be a tackle. I don't think anybody would want to mess with you guys, right? But we do have – we'll put a pin in it. Everyone should know that Senator right. Tester owes me at least a three-on-three basketball game at some time. Maybe we'll do it to raise money for a veterans charity. But let me let, – right? Let me ask you about what's front and oh, center. Yeah. Right, na- right now, uh, the PAC Act, we covered it on this show – maybe the biggest piece of veterans legislation since we all work together on the new GI bill is on to use a football analogy. Maybe we're on the five yard line. Uh, I started talking to you about this back in like 2006. We started this momentum of making people of aware, aware of what is our generation's agent orange. Uh, now, unsurprisingly, you and I have been through this game before. There's one Senator that's been standing in the way back when we did the clay hunt bill, it was Senator Tom Coburn. When we did the Zadroga bills, it was Mike Lee and Rand Paul. Now it's Senator Pat Toomey that John Stewart has made public enemy number one. Uh, can you update folks without going too deep into the bill? Because I think this audience understands the importance of it. Where are we strategically in getting this done? Because you've been the quarterback throughout it. And I want to give you the credit because you deserve it. You took meetings with us early on. You understood it. You carried our message. But we're really close now. So we're recording this on Tuesday. We're going to get this done this week or what? Yeah, we're going to get it done. It should be done on Thursday. Look, uh, we, we got it done for the 4th of July, and there was a mistake made on the House side, which, you know, kind of makes the enamel on my teeth chip because I don't like people <laughs> making mistakes. We passed it with a vote of 84. It would have been 86. We had two senators that were gone that were going to vote for it, but they were gone. 80, 84 votes in the United States Senate is like uh, uh, a incredible huge victory. I mean, you never get those kind of victories on a bill that, that spends uh, – uh, you, you know, close to $30 billion a year, quite frankly, to take care of our veterans. But we've got that kind of vote. Uh, Toomey, who, by the way, I've worked with him on issues and I've been opposed to him on issues. That's the way the Senate works. I'm opposed to him on this one big time. And I don't understand it because the bill passed with 84 votes, yet they're still holding it up, still wasting time. When, quite honestly, every day we waste is another veteran that is dying from uh, a disease, whether it's a cancer or a lung disorder or whatever it may, may be due to burn pits. And then you've got Agent Orange, finally hypertension is covered in this bill. And those folks that live that served in Vietnam and, and were exposed to Agent Orange are older than I am, okay? And I, I'm getting to be older in dirt. So that's, <laughs> that's a problem. And so getting this bill across the finish line is time sensitive. As soon as the Senate passes it, it goes to the president's desk. I believe it'll pass this Thursday. And uh, it'll go to the president's desk immediately, and, and we'll move on from there, and uh, veterans will get the benefits they've earned. So you think we'll finally have a, a signing ceremony at the White House before the summer break? Uh, yeah, it, it could well be before we break for August. We break, I think, on August 4th. Uh, it could well be that week, uh, first, second, third, somewhere in there. Um, you know, and, and that'll be uh, – That'll be a great day for this country, by the way. That, that'll be a, it'll be a great day for this country because what that means is an all volunteer military that we're finally living up the promises you make people when they sign that sheet of paper and, and say, I'm going to serve this country in the military. Can, can Whereas I- before, and you know this, Paul, before folks come back and they had to fight for their benefits, that should not be happening after this bill is signed. So there's like, you know, this is, this is a perfect uh, encapsulation of Washington. There, there's some good in here but it's also frustrating as hell. And I want to just get your kind of no shit take on this. I mean, it's taken us really decades to get this done. And we had a lot of resistance. Um, You had over a dozen senators vote no. And I don't want to focus too much on, on, on the downside here, but I think it's important. How do U.S. senators vote no on something like this and get away with it? And even one senator, who I think Senator Toomey maybe was hoping John Stewart and the whole world wouldn't notice, even if he does block this and it costs us days and it costs us lives, it doesn't seem like there's a real political price to pay for him. So can you, can you talk about that? Because the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, when you guys work together, you're an example of how Washington can work. But when things get stuck there, it's also an example of how Washington is broken. So this is much bigger than about veterans. This is about Washington, about whether government can work on priorities. So how do senators vote no on this and get away with it? I don't know, Paul. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know how. I wasn't here when we sent folks like you off to Iraq. But I don't know how you could send folks to the Middle East or any war as far as that goes. 
And then when they come back changed, you can't pay for it. And by the way, in this particular case, they put the, 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 the bill for the Iraq war was put on the credit card. And now we come back and I heard many of them say they'll all deny it, but it's a fact. I heard him say, Jesus, $278.5 billion over 10 years. That's almost 28 billion a year. We can't afford that. And my point is, is if you can't afford it, you shouldn't send them off. Okay. This is part, this is part of the contract. Part of the contract is if they come out with an arm blown off or they come out with mental health issues or they come out with toxic exposure, we take care of it as a nation. The American taxpayer does. And that's what this is about. And so for those people who voted no, uh, I, I don't know how you can justify it, but they need to be held accountable. Um, one of the members of the VA committee took offense to the VFW holding them accountable with their membership. But the truth is, is that this is the way it is. I mean, this is the way it is. and. And you can always figure out reasons to vote for or against a candidate. It's wherever your priorities are. But number one, you have to vote. And number two, you have to call them out. And that, by the way, that's what people like you, that's what people like Stewart do. That's what that all the folks, I mean, they called them out. They called them out. Stewart called them out on the 9-11 folks, and he's called them out on this, and it's made it happen. But but I want to say something else before we go. Those, those 84 or 86 people who to vote for this bill, I can't thank them enough because we usually don't get that those numbers to vote. I respect everybody who voted against it. Make no mistake about it. I'm going to be working with them at a different venue, and I respect them. But I think it was the wrong vote. It was yeah, and I think, you know, I, I didn't know if we were going to get through with this price tag, right? We've been here before. People said the GI Bill was too expensive. And, and Senator Jim Webb said at the time, no dollar that goes into a veteran's head is wasted. And now we see the long-term impact of that. But I also want to drill down on something else here, Senator. You and I and others, we started strategizing around this over a decade ago. We knew that if we could get to the president because of Bo Biden's personal exposure and his, his, his statement that maybe burn pits caused Bo's cancer and caused his death, that that would be a breakthrough. But I think if we didn't have Jon Stewart, I don't think this would have happened. Like the John Stewart one man shame machine seems to make things move that otherwise can't move, which is, again, kind of an indictment of where Washington is. I hope he can get the Medal of Freedom because if he ever deserved it, it was for this and his work with 9-11 first responders. I hope he comes on the show. But really, like as a political strategist yourself. He was like uh, he was like an MLRS. He's like what the Ukrainians need right now to tip the tide. If we didn't have John Stewart, do you think this would have happened? I don't know, but thank God we had him. And and I will tell you that John was masterful. Uh, John John uh, understood what had to happen. He did not walk into a corner and say my way or the highway. He gave me enough space to work. And by the way, I'm, I wasn't perfect on this bill by any stretch of the imagination, but he gave me the space to work. And and uh, and and I think that his push was huge. I, I can also tell you. Um, that, that Schumer was very, very important in getting this bill across the finish line, as was the president. Um, without, without those two taking this up and taking it seriously, and maybe it was the pressure that Stewart put on him to do it, but I do think the Bo Biden story had an incredible, phenomenal effect uh, on the president, and I think that he took this issue seriously. I think um, Senator Schumer, in the leadership position he has, be able to schedule saying the things he said, that people knew this was coming to the floor, I think it, it made a big, big difference. And in the end, um, you know, we got a big vote out of it. But 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 look, all the VSOs, this was their number one issue, maybe with the exception of one of them, which I don't think really is a VS veteran service organization. But but they all the VSOs were this was their number one issue. They all came in with a voice. You guys at IAVA, when you were the head of that, Paul, were, were, were way ahead of the curve on this stuff. And 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 it's about what happens when people work together, when people say, all right, we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to get this done come hell or high water. And, and that's exactly what happened. And it was not only the folks on the Veterans Affairs Committee, particularly on my side of the aisle, uh, that, that stepped up, but we had a bunch of folks. We had you know, we had folks like Tina Smith and, and Kristen Gillibrand. I hate to start mentioning names, by the way, because I'll forget somebody. But those folks helped to bring this bill to fruition and, and add to it. This bill w was interesting because it's a big bill and it's, it, it, is, uh, it is a bill that we have never seen the likes of, probably, as you pointed out, since the GI Bill. But, but, the, but the bottom line is, is that, that we had so many of these bills that had already been voted on. And people voted on them, assuming they weren't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. so they run out to people like you, Paul, and say, mm -hmm. hey, look, I voted for mm -hmm. Camp June. 
I voted for Camp Lejeune. In fact, I carried Camp Lejeune. So we put them all in the bill. We put them in a bill. And then we found out some of the people who actually carry those bills didn't want those bills to pass because mm -hmm. they voted against them. So it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen, but it's it's Washington. And I will tell you that for normal human beings, and I still classify myself as a normal human being, I try to stay normal. It never ha it never goes without fail. It's something comes up that you just go, how the hell could somebody like vote like this? I just don't know. Well, we're almost there, and, that, and that's going to seem easy maybe compared to some of the other stuff that's coming down the, the, the pike in the next couple of months and years. There's one issue that I want to ask you about because it's something we've covered on the show. It's something I've been focused on, which is the decision to overturn Roe and how it impacts veterans and the military. I think this is one of the most underreported parts of this entire uh, series of events. Amy McGrath was on the show to talk about it. You know I've been working with Allison Jaslow and others on this. It feels like the VA is one place that can actually make a difference. It seems like the VA secretary has some latitude to, to provide support that nobody else in the government can. So I have a two-part question for you. Number one, one of the things we've been trying to do is change the motto to be inclusive for, I don't know, a decade now, and that hasn't moved. The secretary can do it. The president can push it. Is that going to happen? And if it, and why the hell hasn't it happened? This seems like such an easy thing for McDonough and for Biden, and it's a head scratcher. And then separately, what can you all do uh, to support women veterans who right now feel under attack and to include active duty and even potential recruits? If someone lives in California and they're thinking about joining the military, they're worried if they get stationed in Kentucky or somewhere else, they may not have the same access to care that they would somewhere else. So this is a big issue. Number one, the motto. Number two, what, what, what can we do? What can you do more broadly to push on the VA? So it's a massive issue. Uh, I will also tell you that the motto needs to be changed. We're in the 21st century. It's a different military than we had 100 years ago. Okay, it is. Women play an incredibly important part of this. And um, I have not spoken. I, there's been a lot of people that have been pushing for the motto change for some time now. And um, if anybody can change it, it's McDonough. I'll just tell you that. I think that he is a very, very inclusive person and understands that the way it's done now has outlived its time uh, as far as addressing who serves in the military. So so I think women will be included in the model uh, before the end of this presidential term. Don't hold me to it. Okay. So that's two years, right? Like I thought well, this is one of those ones that Biden was going to check the box. I thought well, Biden would check this box right away. Now we're two years in and he still hasn't he may, done it. He may check the box before Christmas. He may check the box for the end of his fiscal year, which is the end of September. Uh, I've, I've been focused on PACT exclusively for the last year and a half. So I really haven't. But the truth is, you know, we uh, I think it needs to happen. And I think it's the right thing to happen. Now the Supreme Court decision on Roe. That's that's a little more tough. And yep. I'll tell you what, it's more tough because it's the United States Supreme Court that made a decision that said, Abortion ain't going to happen. We're going to take away women's rights. We're going to take away, first time in my lifetime, I'm 65 years old. I'll be 66 in a month, less than a month. And and it's the first time in my lifetime we're taking away women's rights in this country. Now, look, I don't, I don't care if you're pro-life or pro-choice. You can't tell me that a woman that goes in and, and has an abortion done, it isn't a gut-wrenching horrible damn decision to make that has been talked over with everybody in their brother, everybody in the family, every minister, every friend, everybody, they're going to talk to everybody about this because it's a hell of a decision to have to make. And instead we got a bunch of folks, males mainly that are out there advocating that, that the females should not have that choice and they shouldn't have that ability to determine it. Uh, it's a horrible damn decision by the Supreme Court. And and I don't know, look, the VA secretary can, and the president can do some stuff with executive order and for rules. But that, I'm going to tell you, Paul, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a farmer, but I don't know that that gets the job done. Because then administrations change and you go back to the other way. I think there's one or two things that have to happen. Either Congress has to act and reinstate these rights for women, or you got to change the Supreme Court. That's right. the way it is. But in the mean, but in the meantime, in the meantime, is, in the meantime is, yeah. there, I would just tell you, Paul, yeah. it pains me to say it because these are great people who have served this country and sacrificed greatly and sometimes sacrificed their life for this country. These are the people that are going to be paying the price for this. 
Yep. And, and it's not acceptable, but we are a country of laws. And I don't think that I can complain about somebody who didn't follow the law because they didn't like it or somebody who didn't go in that was subpoenaed and go in for a, for a, for a court date. And then turn around and say, "Well, we're going to ignore what the Supreme Court said." Can, can, can you guys? Can you guys, as a committee, hold hearings, pressure the VA to say, "Look, explore every technical accommodation you can make within the largest government healthcare system in America." At least, for example, to provide parity with ACA or other examples where the VA can make regulatory changes or access changes. I mean, even if they're small. Like that might be the only place in America that you don't need congressional authorization to make uh, changes to, to to react to this. Is is that's, that possible? Uh, that's absolutely possible. You've got to know, though, that there are folks on the Republican side of the aisle right now that will object and put up every roadblock. And I think that is without exception on the VA. But can't McDonough, can't McDonough do that himself under his authority in the same way the SecDef can? McDonough, can? McDonough can do it with himself. But Paul, yeah. I'm just telling you that's a rule change. There will be another secretary of the VA in a few years. They can easily change it back when he can change it. The real solution here that, 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 that stands the test of time is for Congress to act. I, I, I definitely, I think I understand that. I think folks are looking to the VA as a place uh, where there might be some space, some room, yeah. right? And they can get creative. It seems to be a failure of creativity in a lot of areas. And and maybe we'll, I, we're going to keep a close eye on it. I know you'll keep us updated. Yeah. Let me ask you to, to shift into something kind of building off of that. You know, there's kind of a crisis in America around what I call the duopoly of the two parties, right? You're 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 one of the first, maybe the only uh, statewide Democrat in a long time in Montana you're like an independent in many ways, I think, right? Fetterman's kind of like an East Coast version of you, right? Like in many ways, you're, there's a populism to you. You're talking to people in Montana differently than other Democrats are. It's got to be hard being a, a moderate like you in the Democratic Party right now. And what I really want to ask is, you know, we talk a lot about independent politics. A lot of the people listening here check none of the above. What do you view as the landscape for independent candidates and, and, and unaffiliated candidates going forward in places like Montana and beyond? If you if you ran as an independent in Montana, you might do better than you do as, as a Democrat. Yeah, I think I think the challenge is, is you know, this has always been a, a country of, of two parties. And um, and, and I, I'll answer your first question first. You know, the Democratic Party is a big tent. I've always felt welcome. And and I've, I've, have I had my dis, uh, my uh, uh, have I had my disagreements with some of the leadership? Absolutely, and we make that known. And sometimes I win, sometimes I don't. But that's the way democracy works. Okay. As far as going down the independent line, we've got a prime example in Montana because we've got an independent that's running for the Eastern House District that I've known for 25 years. He's a good guy. He's really a good guy. And he's worked for Republicans, and he's worked for Democrats, and so he's running as an independent. Um, and, and he knows this. Because it's a two-party system, where does he get his money? Because of the two-party system, you know, you got Democrats who are going to siphon votes, you got Republicans who are going to siphon votes. Does he really have a realistic chance of winning in the East? Now, I am still a believer that if you go out and meet the people and you make your case to the people, that anybody can win. Anybody can win. Paul Riker could win in Montana if he went out and made his case to the people. But if you don't, you're not going to win, period. And so uh, I think that that uh, there's certainly room for independent candidates out there. I think we've we've seen them. Uh, uh, we, we've seen them in Maine and we've seen them in Vermont. And uh, and Angus King is different than Bernie Sanders. But there's they're both independents and they're both uh they're both proud of it. Angus is incredibly proud of being an independent from Maine and Bernie the same with Vermont. And and so I think there's room. Uh, I think there's room out there for it. But make no mistake about it. When I first ran for the state legislator, I had a guy legislature. I had a guy come up to me and say, why don't you run as independent? Why are you running as a Democrat? Well, I'm running as a Democrat because I am a Democrat, number one. And number two, if I run as an independent, I got nobody to turn to, really. I mean, hmm. you know, I, I had a guy that was a mentor of mine that was a superintendent of schools when I was going to school there in Big Sandy. And he was a Democrat and he helped me if I was an independent. It's just the way the landscape is. He wouldn't have. And 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 I've got another prime example. When I, in 92, I was contacted by 
a county commissioner says, John, I've got cancer. I want you to run for county commissioner. I said, I'll do it, but I'm going to run as a Democrat. And it was like somebody poured cold water over. So it's the same thing on the Republicans. Yep. Yep. If you well, that. Have- if you don't have the donkey or the elephant beside you, there's a whole bunch of people that are not going to take you for real, especially if they don't know you. If you can get out and let them know who you are, then the possibilities are endless. Mm. Well, I think I think that's a, an indictment of our system, but I understand you, you know your your perspective is valuable because I hope there's a future where you can run as an independent and not have to lean on a party, whoever you are. I know we don't have a lot of time. Your staff's giving me very tight constraints here. I want to ask you another political question. One of the many, you've had many victories for veterans. One of them might have been, it was definitely saving us from Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who could have been VA secretary. He is now saying some really outrageous stuff. He's, he's run and been elected for Congress. Um, he is, in my view, representing a lot of the worst of our politics right now, but he was almost VA secretary. Trump hits you on that in Montana. Uh, and, and I think the Montana voters saw through it. Um, what does that say about our politics right now? You know, you are a reasonable guy. You're a guy who brings the temperature down. You're a guy who finds a path forward. You know, what can we learn from these kinds of situations and, and help the country move forward? Well, I think the bottom line is you got to elect people who are willing to do what's right, period. Just you got to do what's right. And and I'm going to tell you, I had a lot of veterans. I had a lot of active military. I even had people in the administration that told me about Ronnie Jackson. And they asked that I protect them, and I did because I needed to. Uh, because retribution is a horrible thing and they didn't need to be they didn't need to have the axe come down on them they were they were strong enough and brave enough to come to me and all their stories checked out by the way they were all identical every damn one of them and you and there was a bunch of them i mean a bunch of them it's not like these folks could get in a room and figure this out and so i did what i wanted to do there was a similar thing different different reasons but a very similar candidate came up and the VA and 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 the administration pulled them. It wasn't the Republicans that did it. It was the Democrats that did it. I'm not particularly proud of it, but the person could not be confirmed in that position uh, because of his past history. And 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 I think that that that's the key. You've got to have people who are willing to do what's right. And and I was willing to do what's right. And I would do it again. By the way, Paul, I would do it again. And it made that election it would have been an easy coast election, but it made it tougher than hell for me to win. But in the end, when I went to bed at night, I could live with myself. And that's part of the deal. If I'm sitting here and I'm holding my finger up in the air every time the wind blows, I'm changing a position. That's not who I am. And that's not why I was elected. I was elected to do the right thing and represent the people of Montana and make and keep this country the greatest country on earth. And that's what I try to do every day that I'm in office. Well, that's why the Democrats would be smart to make you, you know, more visible as the future of their party, because you're the kind of guy who appeals to independents like me and so many other people. I got one last question for you, then I'll let you go. This is one that, that divides America. This is independent Americans. We try to bring people together. We try to add light to contrast to heat. But there's one question that divides America that you are uniquely qualified to talk about. Senator John Tester, if you had to choose one, pancakes or waffles? Oh, man, Paul, I'm a French toast guy. Ah, oh, so you can't split the difference. Get the hell out of here, man. I'm a French toast guy. You know, put a little maple syrup. Okay, if I got to pick one, pancakes or waffles, and they're just plain. I mean, there's no bananas in them. Whatever you want. Blueberries, none of that stuff. I'm a pancakes guy. What can I say? Although I like waffles, but French toast is my favorite. Okay, so look at me, man. Look at, look at me. <laughs> okay, can you see this? There ain't many foods that I don't like to eat, all right? So, you know, it's six and one half a dozen of the other in most cases, right? I, I did say you were uniquely qualified, and, and you continue to be uniquely qualified as a tremendous leader. I just want to tell you, like, flat out, I appreciate the hell out of you. You represent the best of what this country is all about. Uh, I think everybody respects you, Democrat, Republican, everywhere in between. Uh, I'm honored to know you. I'm grateful for all you're doing. Uh, I hope that we can get together soon and have a drink and some pancakes, waffles, and French toast to celebrate the victory of the PAC Act. And I hope you'll you'll come on the show again so we can continue the conversation uh, in the future. And we got to put a pin in it and get that basketball game, man. So I'll, the basketball game's on. I got to get my Achilles better. But the basketball game's on. I'll come on your show again. But I do want to say something. It's a, it's mutually admiration. You You were one of the first guys I ever met that stepped up and said, okay, you've got a position on the VA committee 
you can do a lot of really good things. And here's what you need to do, John. And, and like you said, we laid out the agenda for toxic exposure 15 years ago. And and it was it was you who I've never served. You served. You talked about the, the Iraq Afghanistan vets passionately and powerfully like you do on this show every week or every day. And, and the bottom line is, is that uh, we did, did what we did on the PACT Act because the veteran service organization, like the one you used to represent, stepped up the plate and made it clear what the expectations were. And you did that from the first day I got in the United States Senate. So thank you, Paul Ryder. Well, you're a great American. I look forward to posting up on you in the paint and, and putting double digits on you and, and Cory Booker. I'm going to get some folks on, on my team and we'll square it up. Um, I'm taking you down, Record. I'm taking you down. <laughs> All right. Well, this is going to be good content. We might ESPN might want this. This is righteous sports coming soon from live inside Tester's office. But you're you're a great American, my friend. I wish you and and your family and your team all the best. I, I hope I see you soon and stay vigilant, my friend. Amen, brother. Be safe. Thank you.